Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Jody Eggington. I'm the technical director at uh, Scuderia Alpha Tori. Um, I'm responsible for the all of the technical activity uh, relating to the design and, and running of, of our cars. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, quite a diverse group of engineers uh, working on this project, aerodynamicists, designers, vehicle performance engineers, electronics engineers, IT technicians, car build specialists, and a whole range of other people who their combined efforts um, allow us to complete the sort of concept and design process of our car and then the development and the operating of that car uh, through the year. So my role is quite diverse in bringing all of this together um, to ensure that we develop the car to the best of our ability and ensure that it's competitive in what is a very competitive championship and that we can sustain the development of our car through what is a very long and competitive season. So it takes a lot of effort. There's more than 200 people involved in just the areas w which I'm responsible for. And my daily task is to ensure that everyone's coordinating and, and, and delivering on what our objectives and targets are in order to be as competitive as possible in the championship and uh, ultimately achieve the highest possible position in the Constructors' Championship. So I know a lot of you today have been uh, contacting us with a number of questions. Uh, that, that you're interested in me, in me trying to ask. So I'll, I'll do what I can today to try and uh, give you the best answer that, uh, that I can. Um, the first question has come through, which is the obvious one. Uh, can Alpha Tori be the best of the rest in this year in the Constructors' Championship? So clearly the top three teams uh, for, for the last period have been performing at a level far ahead of what other teams are able to, to uh, compete at. And there's a difference in budgets and, and uh, the, the size of the organisations involved. Um, last year, we had our best year ever as a team um so we're on a good trajectory with regards to that uh, this year the car is a, is, a, is a is a big evolution of that um it's a very competitive midfield um the, the from position four down to nine four down to ten is going to be very close this year we're in the mix uh, stating the obvious there from testing we think we're in the mix uh to be able to finish the best of the rest this year that's our target it's going to be incredibly hard and i expect it would uh the fourth place team will evolve and change through the season but yeah that an objective is to be competitive and take the next step on from last year and uh, be fighting right at the sharp end of that midfield. So uh, we're hopeful we can do it, but we're going to have to develop the car strongly to, to uh, maintain that position. Um, so, yeah, the next question we've got here. So obviously we hope to be back racing in July. Um, the majority, if not all the tracks we go to, we have a view on how the uh, car setup needs to be. Um, what makes the car tick there, what are the specific requirements. And, and from a regulation perspective, the changes for this year are fairly minimal compared to the previous year where there was a bigger change. So we've got a baseline. Um, there's no trial and error involved. It's far too expensive a business to be applying those sorts of uh, approaches. Um, but we've done our simulations. We've been testing. We've formed a view on what our car strengths and weaknesses are. And as we go to each event, We'll apply the specifics of that circuit and the requirements in order to try and get the best out of our package there. So we've got the baseline from last year, but this year's car is not last year's car. It's evolved. We've taken a step forward with it. We've got to make sure that we get the best out of it at the specific track. So the requirements of this car will be subtly different to last year's car. And then there's track conditions. They can change year on year as well. You should never turn up assuming everything will be the same. That's the probably the easiest way to come away being disappointed. The, the new technical ideas are, th th stem from many sources, to, to be honest. I mean, I have a, a group of senior engineers that report to me and they below them have other engineering groups reporting to them. So it is a constant iteration of ideas and discussion. We try to promote uh, sort of a, a, an open forum within the team that people can come forward with ideas without fear of them being dismissed. The, the forums for doing this can be a discussion or it can be a set of simulations or just a basic idea on, on, a, on a piece of paper that someone says, have you thought about this? So the ideas come from many places, but also the development we're doing leads to other avenues to explore on the aerodynamic side, on the vehicle performance side, tyre learning, um, methods for uh, manufacturing to make the car lighter, stiffer, etc. So these, these um ideas come from many places and, and it's an important thing it's one of the beliefs i have within the team that we promote 
as much of this idea generation as possible right across the group from the the youngest engineer right up to myself if it's just one person contributing it's very unlikely you'll be successful but my role is sort of the conductor to try and bring all of this together and then make the decisions where the decisions have to be made in order to make the best use of our resources and budget so yeah the ideas come from many places The main phase is in the development of our F1 car. Well, if there's a, a large regulation change, which there was uh, the 2019, then your guideline is essentially those changes. And that sets out the, the changes to the concept, the car concept. So we have a bunch of guys working on the, the concept of the car and they'll be looking at the regulations together with some guys from Aero and saying, OK, where do we think the opportunities are to exploit the regulations and take maximum benefit? And then at the same time, on the vehicle performance side, there'll be simulations being run to understand where we think the car performance window needs to be, where we want to put ourselves in terms of which areas we're going to push harder and which ones we might push less hard. And then all of this comes together. A wind tunnel model is, is prepared in the background and that's evolving all the time and there's avenues that are explored. Some of them come to fruition, some of them don't. So we're constantly changing and evolving there. The car design is evolving along with that. And then we have certain points where we have to start freezing things. Obviously, if we're in a fortunate position currently where we've got a, a steady engine partner, we know exactly what's going on there. We know roughly what the engine packaging requirements are. And we understand how Honda work now in our third year with them. So that's very positive. So we start freezing pieces of the car as we move on. We have the chassis free state because the manufacturing time scale for that's quite long. It's you know, probably four weeks after the August shutdown when it's in the normal time, we have to freeze that. And then as we go along with freezing other areas of the car, the radiator package needs freezing. There's relatively long lead times there. And then we keep going, keep going, keep going. You're freezing crash structures, noses, bodywork. And then the aero evolution keeps going. At the time you're designing and manufacturing the parts for the launch spec car, the aero guys are already working on the updates and they'll be frozen later. The certain areas of the car we develop very strongly in the year, floors, wings, et cetera, et cetera, bodywork, barge boards. So the process just iterates, but all you're doing is reducing which areas you're working on in line with your budget and your resource. So given what's happened, how has the development program of this year's ATO one changed? So, I mean, the, the development program we already had in place, we know where we are, we know what we wanted to introduce, but what has happened because of the unfortunate situation with COVID-19 and our uh, earlier and extended shutdown meant, has meant that we've had delays. No one has been able to work for the last two months. Um, we go back to work next week. So but the activities we were working on, be it design, aero or manufacturing, have, have been stopped and they'll be restarted again. But also the calendar is looking like it's going to take a very different form. So parts we might have needed for a certain race, we won't need any more. Monaco not happening this year being one example. So we're having to change the order of the, the release of parts. Some of these parts are through the wind tunnel. Some of them are not. So we have to quickly get parts developed into the wind tunnel, change what we call the wind tunnel schedule or the wind tunnel program, then change the design release programs and then try and change our priorities for manufacturing. So at the moment, there's an awful lot of what if scenarios in my head. And, we're, and we'll, when we're back at work, we'll put those to fruition and get the development of the car. But in terms of what we intended to do, the areas of the car we wanted to work on, like every other team, we'll still be pushing forward with them. It's just the making, minimizing any delays due to the unfortunate situation. Uh, with with the extended shutdown. So yeah, uh, the shutdown has been longer uh, and earlier, and it all happened rather quickly, which it needed to do given the world situation. Um, you never stop thinking. In in, uh, in my position, and also generally in Formula One, you're always looking and thinking about what the next opportunity can be, keeping an eye on what other people are doing, what they're saying. Um, so when you're away from the office, you know, you, it's always on your mind. It's been a constant thing in the background. What we're going to do, what will be the, the programme, trying to rest, uh, have a view on what the next race is likely to be. Where were we with the car? We, we've got a rough idea or fairly good idea in winter testing, actually, where the car's strengths and weaknesses are. So we've got to try and develop those as quick as we can. So, yes, uh, a lot of reflection, a lot of scribbled notes and a lot of things to get into next week as soon as the shutdown's over and we can start uh, thinking about getting back up to speed as quickly as possible and developing the car as quickly as possible in what's likely to be an incredibly busy season.
That's a good question here. Yeah, do, do, do I think that uh, Alpha Tori could reach a level where it actively competes on the same level as Red Bull? And would that be allowed? I mean, my the targets I've been set, the objectives, my remit, if you will, is is is, is to is to develop a car that allows Alpha Tori to be as competitive as possible, and, and and that's it. We have a healthy budget. It's not the largest budget on the grid. It's not the smallest budget on the grid. Um, with the regulation changes and budget cap going forward, that alignment will increase. But within that, we should be in a position where we can be very competitive in the midfield and be towards the the sharp end of it. That's the objective. Um, we've got closer to Red Bull. They're a fantastic uh, team. They did a fantastic job. And we last year, we got a lot closer to them. If we get closer, that's good. Um, I don't think anyone would prevent it. There'll be no one telling us that that's not permitted. But in the scheme of things at the moment, that would be incredible, incredibly difficult to do. But with the regulation changes and the budget cap, I can see the situation where we should be getting closer to Red Bull. Um, so at no point is that going to be a, a, a topic to avoid. It, it's something we want to do. But at the moment, the key point is to be as competitive as we can with the resources we've got and, and uh, prove to our shareholders that we're giving value for money in terms of uh, promoting the brand of the team and making best use of the resources, really. The first thing I would change in a Formula One car if there was no rules, or if there was no rules, that would be uh, fantastic from an engineering perspective. You could uh, fulfill all of your uh, wildest dreams, but you would need unlimited funds and uh, <laughs> unlimited funds and uh, resource to do that. So, uh, uh, what, what would I change? Oh, in all honesty, I think the way the regulations are going with a budget cap, it, it probably sounds a little bit obvious at the moment, but it should allow increased competitiveness across the grid, to be honest. So I think, you know, ultimately, I would like to see uh, increased competitiveness across the grid anyway. If we take the 2019 season, in my opinion, the midfield, fantastically competitive. If all 10 teams can operate in that level of competitiveness, I think that would be a fantastic thing. So anything we can do to bring the field closer together and make it more competitive, the racing will become more exciting. It's been good anyway recently, but it will get even better. So I think that would be the thing to do. So every race, you've got, you know, 20 cars capable of uh, standing on the podium. Uh, specifically how you do that, you know, it's a, it's a money-driven business. So anything we can do to align that makes sense. Um, so I think there's no single specific thing, but the direction we're heading it will hopefully see us be more competitive and that's the change that's needed. What is the most appealing technical aspect of Formula One today? Oh, I mean, it's uh, uh, in a very general terms for me anyway, that the most fantastic thing about it is um, every two weeks you get to see where you are. You know, you, you can have a race. You might not perform too well. You've got to address that for the next race. Or well, technically, your car might have weaknesses which need to be addressed. Everyone's car does have that. It's just to what extent and how many there are. So um, the, it, it's, an, it's an exciting challenge for me to try and find solutions to improve the competitiveness of the car. Um, and trying to do that within the framework of your budget and the number of people you have. So the, the technical aspect there is making best use of what you've got. So, um, so some nice aerodynamic solution, solutions which are investigated in the background. And if you can start making them work and develop them strongly in the season, that can give you a good step forward. We had a good basic concept last year, which developed very well. It becomes quite challenging when your basic technical car concept doesn't develop so well and you're looking for bigger changes to try and sort of reignite the development process. So for me, um, just, the, just the fact that every two weeks you've got to keep developing the car is, you know, and typically aerodynamics is a big player in this. And then optimise everything you've got. The power unit needs optimising. If you don't get that right, it's a big performance differentiator. Typically teams are very good at doing this, so you don't see this too often. So, on the, so to answer the question, sort of broad brush, the aero development, is, is an appealing technical aspect to the sport because it, it's, it's very critical to performance levels and just ensuring you optimize the car every two weeks they're very complicated vehicles and uh, they take a lot of optimizing and a team effort and everybody has to uh, do their bit in order to come away from a race saying we got the most out of the package just because you've got a quick car doesn't mean the car will be quick if you don't get your homework right and it right on the on the grand prix weekend you can come away with results which are far lower than the car and the team are capable of so that's an interesting challenge and key. So next question here, where do we select our mechanics? Uh, only from Formula Future. And what's the advice to give on this? Well, I mean, 
for mechanics and engineers, there's a there's a number of routes in a, as a as a mechanic. Let's say someone who's hands on with the car. Normally, these guys are coming through via an apprenticeship or through and then through lower formula, or coming to work at the team in the factory based role and then taking a travelling role. For engineering and design staff, um, we have the Formula Future program, which has been fantastic. It allows us to um, take a lot of uh, very smart and bright and, and, and clever young undergraduates and graduates for a year give them experience to the various different parts of the team and then hopefully from that if we have the positions available we, we can recruit a number of those it's very competitive business so that's a good way in um so via your university make an application for a placement for the formula future program um there's a placement in a various groups design aero electronics vehicle performance get a year's experience See for yourself, it's for you. It might not be for you after your first experience of it. You, there are people who say, well, it's really not what I thought. It's not for me. But once you've got that experience, you you show the teams what you can do. And then from that point on, if there's positions open, you, you're in the game to, to try and get a, a position, a junior position in the team. So it, it's quite it's quite challenging. What, what I would say to do is for people who are looking to get into it is sort of try to get as much experience as you can. Um volunteering to work for teams in the lower formulas just getting experience doesn't matter what it is and what area the experience of racing and getting a view on how the business works and then through your degree um apply for placements and then from that you get the opportunity to especially in alpha Tori, to move around the team understand what the different functions in the team are decide where you want to specialize because this, these are we're big we're a small team in formula one terms but we're still 400 people so we're looking for aerodynamicists, designers, engineers. So through that specialism, you can evolve your career. If you're a vehicle performance engineer initially, then you want to go trackside, then there could be opportunities there. As an aerodynamicist, you have chance for progression. And you can also end up trackside as a, an aero performance engineer. So my, my my advice would be get as much experience as you can. Focus on your studies because the academic side of it is very important to get the relevant skills to be able to uh, operate in this environment because it is cutting edge. It's a lot of hours. It, it's quite challenging and uh, you have to want to do it. It's not a place to be if it's if you're looking for a nine to five. It's, it's actually the last place you'd want to be in that scenario. Ah, Technical question. How different were the dynamics of the car with a multi-link suspension in the front as compared to the previous traditional double wishbone setup? Well, there's two facets to a multi-link suspension. When I say multi-link, what we're referring to here is an upper or a lower wishbone or both, not being a single piece in the shape of a V, but having a link on the outboard side as well. Um, there's an aerodynamic benefit there because it allows you to influence differently the, the aero structures over, uh, that are flowing over the car and control the various flows. But also there's a kinematic influence in as much as you can actually use these um, links to manipulate parts of the kinematic be it caster camber gain etc etc so dominant is aero in all honesty um because if you you've got to get the flow structures doing what you want and get the air moving in the right in the right directions and not disturbing other parts of the car that it shouldn't be if you're not achieving that objective then any kinematic or mechanical objective is unlikely to um, bring you a huge return if there's an aero deficit so the multi-link suspension allows you an aero and a mechanical advantage in terms of controlling what the car is doing at the end of the day secondary to and a very close second um to, to what you want aerodynamically and in some instances probably not even secondary is getting the tire to do what you want we're all using the same tire so for multi-link perspective uh, kinematic can provide you with a tire usage or a tire performance benefit you take that as well but none of this can be accepted with an aero deficit so long story short it just it gives you a bit more freedom to get what you want from the car kinematically. At the same time, you've got to keep an eye on stiffnesses and other things as well. It's all a trade-off. If you focus too much on one aspect of uh, the design process at the expense of other aspects of it, you'll have a net slower car. So there's benefits in there, but it's not just the case of going, right, multi-link, fantastic, got that on the car, should be faster. It's all got to work together. Otherwise, it will just be slower. Ah, if I was given an F1 time machine, would you prefer to go back to the past or forward to the future? Uh, I'd like to quickly go to the end of the season, see where we are, then quickly come back to now and put solutions in place. <laughs> but in seriousness, um, I think I'd like to go forward, really. I think it's great 
uh, the, the future technology is the thing to look at. Which way is it going? What is motorsport of the future? The, how will that influence our daily lives? Which way will the technology go? I think it'd be, it's fantastic to see that we're, we're getting tasters of it, but to be able to go forward and see exactly what's happening would be fantastic. To go back has merit as well, but we've been there and the world's changing and it's all recorded and we know what things have done. So from a nostalgia perspective, to go back and be part of some you know, fantastically competitive eras or eras where there was massive technological change would be fantastic. But ultimately, I'd like to go forward, see what's going on, understand which technologies are in play and, and how that's affecting our life because things are evolving very quickly and to get a, a view of that would be fantastic. It would also allow us to sort of steal a march on the competition with regards to which way regulations are going and where we put our resource but yeah forwards for me did i already want to work in formula one when i was a student i wanted to work in motorsport when i was a from a young child onwards i think i had to speak, check my parents but I, yeah it was always what i wanted to do um there was never anything else for me i wanted to work in motorsport i wanted to be an engineer um and and I was one of those lucky people who were always clear on what they wanted to do, sort of step through the various academic requirements with a clear aim and goal, and then just went from there, really. I mean, my, if you'd have asked me what my target was when I was 16, I'd have wanted to have been a race engineer. I was fortunate enough to be a race engineer. And then from then on, it's just an evolution. But yeah, it was something that I, that I always wanted to be. So in that respect, I've been incredibly lucky to work in different teams, different environments, and sort of tick all of the boxes but it, it it's a small world once you're in you move forward and you, you get new interests and new specialisms w w within the field of motorsport but yes it uh it, it was my work-life ambition let's say how crucial are the suspension arms for the aerodynamics can they affect affect the whole airflow to the whole car yes they can i mean coming back to my previous point a multi-link suspension could in theory give you uh, a strong benefit in terms of flow control and weight control there. So if you've got a clear view on what you want to do, which we all have, can't go into specifics here, but each team knows exactly what they're trying to do aerodynamically or, or what their targets are, then there's various tools you can use to achieve that. Um, suspension arms is, is one of the things which are, you know, disturbing airflow and you can manipulate the geometry there within the regulations to try and get that airflow to go where you want. There's been a couple of uh, recent, Good, interesting solutions there. Red Bull Racing for this year have moved the track rod rearward of the wishbone. Normally that's in front, typically. It doesn't have to be. Um, there's probably a, a, some discussion on blockage into brake ducts and other things. They've moved it rearwards to move that out of the way. For them, that that's probably providing a solution to what their targets were. It's not an approach we've taken, but generally I would say people like to keep things which are not aiding their aero targets out of the way. So getting the bits that are in the airflow to work for you and not against you is a very general comment is a thing you want to do. So, uh, yeah, the suspension arms are a big, a, a big bit of that, but it even starts forward of there with making sure you've got the, the front wing, the nose structure, doing what you want to do, feeding the air, generating the amount of outwash that you need and, and making sure that all the aero services downstream are, are receiving clean flow and everything's sort of working with each other and not against each other. If you've got flow ingress under the floor, in places that you don't want or other suboptimal flow structures it can cause all manner of issues and until you've got on top on where on top of where the problem is it's difficult to know exactly how you're going to solve it so yeah there are also parts which you can't iterate every race you know a formula one wishbone is a complex piece it's subject to huge loads it's it, it's a carbon structure it's you know typically um the structural section is the is the section that's, that's in the airflow so if you want to start fiddling with these in the season and making chassis changes, it's a big job. So teams do it, but it's important to have a clear view on what you want these parts to provide you aerodynamically and structurally, of course, and then work around that in the year because they're long lead time items. Do I ever want to be an F1 driver? In all honesty, no, uh, I don't have the talent. The, 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 the level of talent that these guys have is, is astounding. And uh, it's not something that I've, I've, I've done in my youth. I, I didn't come up through the ranks driving or anything. For me, the engineering side w w w was and remains the exciting thing. I'm also far too old now in, in, uh, in addition to probably an extreme lack of talent in this field. So, no, not for me. I'm very, uh, I was always happy to be the engineer in the background trying to optimise the car and give the driver the best package for him to showcase his talent. So, uh no, it's not something uh, that ever really crossed my mind. It was all about the engineering for me and the racing. I'll let the, we'll let the talent drive the cars and we'll just try to do our bit to make them uh, 
as, as, as quick as they can be and, and, and as, uh, give the driver the opportunity to shine. What do I think about the cooperation with Honda? And do we see a clear advantage in having a works like partnership as opposed to having customer engines? I mean, firstly, I would say I think the line between a works PU and a customer PU is becoming more and more blurred now uh, with the way the regulations are going. But in all honesty, since being at uh, Alpha Tour and formerly Toro Rosso, we'd had uh, Renault power units, Ferrari power units, then the move to Honda when we moved, we moved to them was good. It was a very different approach from Honda. They'd come off the back of a interesting experience with McLaren and we'd come off the back of being supplied engines by Renault and Ferrari, which we had very little technical input into. Honda come along and basically say, what do you want from a power unit packaging perspective? And it was fantastic. It was like being in the sweet shop. It was really great to work with them and refreshing. And also the fact that we've now built on that partnership historically with Toro Rosso there's been a lot of PU changes it's a massive job when you're changing PU you have to get your head around the packaging requirements the heat exchange requirements etc cetera, etc cetera. if you're working with the same supplier you build up a relationship and we also have a lot of input into what the PU packaging is together with uh, Red Bull Racing who are also now on board with this power unit so working with Honda has been fantastic uh, they've been great when we had our very first meeting with them in Japan um, we had a wish list of what we'd like, and uh, they ticked all the boxes in the first year. It's been fantastic. They've, they've been great to work with. It's been an interesting uh, sort of cultural experience between Japan, Italy, and then the UK, because our wind tunnel's in the UK. But it, it's all worked really well. They're a fantastic partner. Um, they, they deliver on uh, what you ask, and we try to deliver on what they ask, and it's been great. It's uh, It's been really nice having more input and exposure to, to the power unit side of it. And as a team, it, it's been great. It was daunting in the first moments, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change the experience we've had and the benefit we've taken from it for anything. It's been really good for uh, Alpha Tori and I'm pretty sure Honda have uh, got positive experience from it as well. We've been fairly successful with them. So I think that's uh, an endorsement of the program. So another question here, if I wasn't an engineer, what would I like to have done with my life? Oh, very good question. Well, I was quite clear on what I wanted to do, but uh, um, if I'd not been an engineer, uh, I don't know, probably would have been an engineer in another field if it hadn't been motorsport. Uh, it was quite like music. So the idea of being a sound engineer was also quite appealing. But to be honest with you, uh, it was uh, I, it was clear for me that motorsport was where I wanted to be. And uh, that was where I was going. Um, so it, it, it sounds like a cop out, but it never really crossed my mind. I was clear I was going to get there one way or another. So, yeah, if there was anything, it would have probably been a sound engineer. Uh, as opposed to motorsport. How do I find living in Italy? Well, my time split between Italy and the UK. I'm in the UK at home at the moment. We shut down, but typically on four days a week in uh, Italy, one day a week in the UK at the Wind Tunnel, which is in Bista. Um, so Italy, fantastic food. Uh, the weather's better than the UK, a little bit too hot in the summer for an Englishman, maybe. Uh, the level of commitment from the guys in Faenza and, and the will to succeed has been amazing. And uh, it's uh, you're working in this Formula One bubble. I mean, credit to the guys. Everyone speaking English in Faenza, in the factory environment, all the all the meetings are held in English, all the documentation, report writings in English. So it's not such a a, a, a culture shock, really. Working there, you're working in this F1 environment, and it's pretty similar wherever you are. I've worked in a number of teams, but uh, it. it I like Italy. I've, I've, I've got a soft spot for it. The people are very passionate about their motorsport. Um, and I think the combination of the sort of English way of doing things and the Italian way of doing things and then adding the mix of Honda on top, it, it's quite a good combination. So, uh, yeah, being in Italy is, 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 is good. It's a different experience. It's enriching career-wise. They're, they're culturally different, but there's benefits to be had there. And uh, it's quite a multicultural team. I mean, as I said, it's based in Faenza. Also, Bister in the UK, and then the, the, the nationalities that work on these sites are incredibly varied. So, uh, yeah, that's another massive positive for motorsport for me that you get to work in these fantastic environments and with many different people. How much effort goes through switching to switching brand names and livery design from Toro Rosso to Alfa Tori? <laughs> Good question. Um, I mean, I'm not involved on on the on the day-to-day -day re rebranding uh topics really we knew it was coming we knew what the plan was um so from our side it, you know it's 
the paint scheme changed, all the garaging, all of the team kit, everything changed. And that was all dealt with in the background. We just had to make sure that everything, the schedules for car build and car delivery were not affected by this. Things had to happen regardless of how late the decision on rebranding would have been. Um, documentation wise, you know, there's an awful lot of email traffic, an awful lot of documentation. You're having to change all of your letterheads, PowerPoints, and it's just a case of making sure that you're, you've got the correct, you know, we are the shop front for the Alpha Tori brand. So it's important that we're pushing that as the, uh, the, the branding from the get go. So, you know, making a mistake and having Toro Rosso as an email footer is not acceptable. So it's, it's just discipline really. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we are their, their, their marketing tool. So whatever they want, uh, you know, it was our job to, to deliver. And I have to say the car launch and everything surrounding it has been fantastic. I mean, uh, as an engineer, it's not normally at the, the forefront of my mind, but it's been a really good experience. I've really enjoyed it. And I think uh, the rebranding has been fantastic for the team. The car looks great. And, uh, yeah, so from our side to be part of that, it's been a good experience. Uh, I was a bit nervous and at some points thinking, oh, how much is this going to impact us? But the guys who are on the front line doing this, the marketing, communication, the guys in Alpha Tour as well, have done a fantastic job of uh, making all of this happen, done a fantastic launch and allowed us to get on with our technical activities without fear of causing them delays or those, those guys fearing that they're causing us problems. So it's, it's been good. It's been good. Name my favourite book, film, and TV series. Whoa, whoa. Uh, book, in all honesty, I probably don't really have a, a favourite book. I, I read a lot, but uh, it's, it's really varied uh, depending how long the flight is or, or where I am and what I'm doing. So uh, I, I, I read quite a diverse range of things, really. You know, if someone buys you a book, you read it. I think it's important to try and read as many different things as you can to get a good worldview. Uh, favourite film? <laughs> um my wife will laugh, but it's probably The Great Escape. I watched it as a child. I thought it was fantastic. Always hoping Steve McQueen clears a second jump, but he doesn't. And a TV series. Again, uh, I, I, I move from one thing to the next, to be honest. With, with all of the streaming things now, you just jump jump from one thing to the next. So as lame as it is, I, I don't particularly have one. But uh, with the long flights and a lot of traveling, there's always something... Uh, there's always one series or another on, on my iPad to, to be watched in moments when I'm not losing sleep over Formula One. Thanks a lot to everyone for their questions. I hope I've been uh, able to give you some insight into the, the things I'm involved in and what my everyday activities are in, in Toro. So I, I, sorry, in Alpha Tori, apologies. Um, stay safe. I hope it's been enjoyable for you guys and let's hope we're back racing soon and, uh, we can put on a good show this year and have a competitive season and give you guys something to uh, cheer on. Thanks a lot for your time. Goodbye.